director here at Hartville Hardware, and it's my pleasure this morning to bring you Ralph Bagnell. He is going to be sharing with you a presentation on optimizing your table saw. Um, everything that you need to know to um, save when you're operating your saw. Uh, Ralph comes to us with over 30 years' experience. I think you'll really enjoy his presentation. I had the opportunity to hear him yesterday, and it was really really interesting and uh, a lot of good, uh, good input. So join me in welcoming Ralph. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Good morning, all. Everybody here? Mike's working good? Thank you. All right, a uh, couple of quick notes before we get started. I like to do an interactive class. So we've got plenty of time as I'm speaking, as we're talking about these various topics. If there's something you want more information on or have a question about, don't hesitate to stick your hand up, jump up and down, scream hey dummy, whatever it takes to get my attention. Um, you know, if you wait till the end, you'll either forget the question that you had or everybody will be milling around and you won't get your question answered. So go ahead and feel free to raise your hand, get noticed, and, and we have plenty of time to do that. We had a really good show yesterday, so we should be able to do that. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm a 30-year uh, veteran of the woodworking industry and working in professional shops and selling equipment, and now I consult in the woodworking industry. I've been writing for several of the magazines since 2000, and for the last, uh, well, since June of last year, I have a woodworking TV show on Amazon Prime called Wood Academy that is free to view, and anybody wants to find out more about that, I've got some information up here at the end, you can come up and talk to me about it, whatever. Um, I am here actually representing MicroJig, and so I will talk a little bit as we go through about the MicroJig products, but that's not what I'm here to talk about primarily, so if you've got any questions, please come up and see us in the MicroJig booth later on, and uh, I'll be happy to lay out you know, everything that we make and what we can do. A properly tuned table saw is going to be safer to use, it's going to give you better, more accurate results, and uh, it's just going to make your woodworking more enjoyable. And you know, if you fear what you're doing in the wood shop, you're not going to enjoy your time there. You're more likely to hurt yourself, and it's just not going to be as pleasant an experience. So we're going to start out by talking about setting up and tuning your table saw, getting it set up properly so that you can utilize it properly, and then we'll talk about some safety issues with it, and then I'm going to talk about some jigs and fixtures and a little bit more of the advanced technique stuff. But again, please feel free to interrupt me as we go along. All safe and accurate work starts with a properly set up and tuned table saw. And I don't care if you're using a 25-year-old Sears contracting saw or the latest generation of saw stop cabinet saw that you know runs you five thousand dollars. You can get good results off of any of those pieces if they're properly set up in two. So the very first thing you're going to want to do is actually go ahead and chopper, read your instruction manual. All right, let's start right there. Uh, because I'm going to talk about setting up the table saw, but there's different types of saws and they all set up a little bit differently. So you really do need to consult the manual to see what it is you're doing. And if you don't have the manual for your saw, in this day and age, just about every manual for everything ever made is online somewhere. So find it and download the PDF somewhere and keep it so that you'll always have it. So the first thing we do after the basic assembly of the saw is we need to tune it up. And we're going to start with aligning the top of your saw to the actual blade. Now, on a cabinet saw, this is a contractor saw so it doesn't have it, on a cabinet saw, everything that is the saw actually mounts to the cabinet. That's what the definition is. And so the top actually is probably the easiest to adjust. There's four bolts underneath outside the cabinet that you loosen up, and then you just use a mallet to tap the, the top and get it aligned to where you want it. On a contractor saw like this one, the trunnions and the parts that hold the saw and the motor and everything else are all mounted to the underside of this top. You're going to have to get in underneath there, find the bolts that hold all of that, loosen them up and adjust them. Your owner's manual will tell you exactly how to do that, and it's something that you want to really pay attention to. Now, one of the things that I like for doing that is, since we're aligning everything to the blade, 
Um, they do make a setup plate. It's a quarter inch thick steel plate that's 10 inches in diameter, and it's been actually milled to be perfectly flat. So it gives you a much uh, more accurate way of measuring uh, from the miter slot to the saw blade, which is how we set the top. We want the miter slot and the saw blade to be perfectly parallel. And this saw is unplugged, so I can raise the blade right up. I want as much distance from front to back as I can possibly get, because the more distance I have here to measure against, the more accurately I can set it up. And then not, not all saw blades are perfectly flat, so you don't want to measure from front to back, per se, but you want to mark where one of the teeth is, measure it at the front, and then measure it at the back by rotating the blade so that you're measuring off the same point of the blade. Now, one thing that they do sell here, actually, they have two different versions of this. Um, this is a magnetic caliper base. It works for your digital uh, caliper. And this one, you know, it's magnetic, so I would set it actually on my, probably on my miter gauge. And that allows me to slide my, my, my uh, digital micrometer back and forth to measure very precisely. There's another version of this. They don't have it. They sold out of them yesterday. But it actually clips into the miter slot itself, and it holds your caliper. That's what I use in my shop, and it's really, really accurate and very easy to use for setting up your saw. Now, once you've got the table saw set, uh, the table set to the blade, now the next step is to adjust the fence so that it is also parallel to the blade. We don't do it separately, though. We want to do it all as a unit. So the easiest way to set the, the fence now that we know the miter slot and the blade are parallel, we're also going to set the fence to the miter slot. Now, a down and dirty fast way to just check it is to check your rib fence so that it's even with the miter slot up front here. And then if I check in the back, I've got a lip here. This one's out a little bit. It needs to be adjusted. And they all adjust a little bit differently. So once again, that pesky manual comes into play here. Um, this one has a pair of set screws on the very front. So you lift it out, you can adjust the set screws to adjust the T-bar angle, and then you've got to set it back into place, lock it in, and make sure. Once you've got that set up where you want it, and again, using a digital micrometer here will give you a much more accurate check than just finger checking. I usually do the finger check when I do my monthly maintenance on my saw. I always just double check everything, and I just do the finger check, and if it doesn't feel good, then I'll go, go to the micrometer. And then once I've got that square to the blade, on the top of the miter bar here, you'll notice there's a pair of nylon set screws here and here, which are actually um, nylon bolts that ride on the rail that allow me to actually square the fence perpendicular to the table. Now, this is about a, probably about an inch and three quarters or two inches tall here. So there's not a lot, it, you know, it would be very hard to accurately measure it, but if you put a tall fence on here to raise a panel or something, all of a sudden, that perpendicular starts to make a real difference. So make sure you've got everything completely set up. So now we've got our table saw itself set up. The, the table is parallel to the blade, or the miter slots on the table are parallel to the blade. Our fence is parallel to the blade. You will find some people who will tell you, well, I like to have the, blade, the fence drift just a few thousands away from the blade so that things don't bind up when I go through. Wrong answer. You want everything to be perfectly parallel, as perfectly parallel as you can, because if the fence is drifting off to one side, you're cutting sideways across the blade, not parallel with it. You're going to guarantee that your part intersects those rear teeth as they come up out of the, saw, uh, out of the table. So always go for as close to parallel as possible. Now we need to set up our miter gauge. Now, to be perfectly frank, the miter gauges that come with most saws are reasonably bad. And in fact, point of fact, on the less expensive saws, the miter gauges actually tend to be better quality. Okay? If you look at the ones that are on some of the more expensive saws that are up there, um, they're hard to adjust. They're really not set up properly. And I asked the manufacturers about that one time, and they actually told me. Our users are going to buy their own aftermarket fire gauge anyway, so there's no point in putting money into this. Well, if you put a decent miter gauge on, maybe we wouldn't have to buy an aftermarket one. That's a different argument for a different day. So here, what you'll see is 
Every miter gauge is slightly different. They're all nominally three quarters of an inch. But from brand to brand, and even from table saw to different levels of table saw within a brand, they're not always going to be exactly 0.75. And so what they do is they make the miter bar a little bit less than three quarters of an inch. Even if you're buying an aftermarket one, that's going to be the case. And then there's some kind of mechanism built into that bar to expand it to meet the width of your actual miter gauge. So in this case, you've got two holes on here, and there's a slot cut in between them, and a set screw in the middle. So I can set this into my miter slot. There's a little bit of play there, so I can then adjust these two spacers until the thing doesn't have any side to side play. And that's critical because if you're trying to cross cut a piece to a precise number and it's rocking back and forth here, you're never going to get any kind of precision. So you can adjust that in. And you're going to have to do that even if you buy an aftermarket miter gauge. Um, there are any number of really good aftermarket miter gauges out there. Craig makes a great one. Uh, Inker makes a very good one. I happen to use the um, Osborne EV3, uh, which is fairly large and very substantial, but it's a really good unit. But I also use the one that come, came with my Delta originally for my jigs and fixtures and stuff. So I've got both. So that needs to be adjusted out. And then all of these miter gauges have uh, some kind of a set of stops on them for various angles that you want to cut. The angle stops are important, but not as important as the 90 degree stop that you're going to end up at. So you really want to double check and make sure that your 90 degree preset is actually 90 degrees to your blade because that's the one you're going to use the most. So now we've got everything set up and tuned properly on top of our saw. The next thing we want to talk about is inside the saw there are stops for the blade at 45 degrees and then again when we return the blade to 90. They're usually kind of a pain to set on every saw. I've never met a saw that has an easy one to set. But take the time to do that, again, especially the 90 degree coming up. And you want to make sure that your 45 is not set too far so you can't quite get to 45. If you're going to, if you're going to fake it, fake it more than 45, not less. But when you return the blade perpendicular, if that stop is set up, you don't have to get your square out and check your blade every time you reset. You can just go to the stop and you know it'll be accurate. And it just makes everything smoother and faster in your shop. So take the time to set those as well. Now, I'm, I've got a military background. Maintenance is key in my life. I maintain my saw and all the equipment in my shop. Typically, every two months, I'll take a day and just spend it in the shop cleaning, lubricating, checking alignments and things like that. I use my shop every day. It is a professional shop, so it's important for me to keep that up all the time. And it's important for you, too, because if a bolt's coming loose, that's when you're going to find it before it falls out. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that you'll find. One of the things that um, is fairly critical is no matter how good or poor the dust collection in your saw is, dust still collects inside your saw. And all of the moving parts in there need to be lubricated. Stay away from using grease because grease basically just attracts dust and it builds up and it becomes a, a problem in, in and of itself over time. I happen to like, there's a couple of different options for dry lube on the inside of my table saw. Specifically, the arc parts for the trunnions where everything rises as you angle, and then the lead screws that both raise and lower your blade and do the angle, those tend to gum up with grease and dust very quickly. So this is a lubricating powder that is graphite powder. Even though it's in a little tube, it's actually powder that you just kind of sprinkle on there. Great stuff. It'll keep everything moving nicely, but it, it's completely dry, so it doesn't collect dust. This is a spray compound. It's a little bit easier to use because you can kind of spray things from a distance. It sprays on wet. It dries in about a minute to a dry, again, graphite powder film. So these kind of products are excellent for that because they keep everything moving smoothly without building up the dust. Uh, Next, let's talk about blades here for a minute, because that's where the rubber meets the road here. Um, nine times out of 10, when you send a blade out to be sharpened by a professional sharpening service, it doesn't need to be sharpened, it just needs to be cleaned. 
And when you sharpen it, you're removing carbide from the blade. So if you can keep it clean, number one, you'll pay for sharpening less often, you'll get better cuts, number two, and number three, you'll get better blade wash. So um, here in Hartville, they do sell a nice, uh, this is by the same people who make Bow Shield, the, the rust preventative uh, stuff. It's a blade bit cleaner. It works very well. Um, I use Franmar's soy gel based cleaner for my saw blades, which I also like a great deal. And I clean my blades fairly regularly. What happens is when you're cutting, it's not wood that builds up on your saw blade, it's the resins and the oils, the pitch from inside the, the hardwoods that you're using. And even if you're not using hardwoods, the glue that they use to glue plywood together, that stuff vaporizes during the cutting process because it heats up. And then just like condensation on, the, on your windshield on your car, the first cool thing it, that vapor hits, it's going to condense. And that's what that gum and pitch is that's on your blades and your router bits and things like that. So by keeping the teeth clean of that stuff, you'll sharpen less often, which will last your, make your blades last longer and give you cleaner cuts. It's very, it takes years, literally, of normal operating use to wear the carbide just by cutting the wood. The two things that kill the carbide faster are the gum and pitch buildup and most importantly, heat buildup. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into cutting techniques. So keeping the blades clean and, and sharp, you want to inspect your blades. If for some reason there's a blade, a tooth that's chipped or damaged. If it's an inexpensive blade, get rid of it and get a new one. If it's a more expensive blade, you can send it back to the manufacturer and have the teeth fixed and rebrazed, new teeth brazed on. So depending on the cost of your blade, you can do that sort of thing. All right, what's up next? I, the question is about um, digital readouts. And I talked to somebody yesterday about the, he's got the Wixie red fence scale, which I've actually, I used a prototype of that from Delta many years ago. Um, and I like the concept a lot. I haven't used one myself. Um, but yeah, you can, are you talking about the type that's magnetic and it just sticks onto your blade? Yeah, actually, there's a, I did a video on my YouTube channel uh, several years ago. They actually have one for the iPhone that'll check the angle. The only problem I had is I use the hardened case on my iPhone. It's not real precise, so that doesn't work for me. But yeah, those digital angle finders are awesome. Um, but I'll be perfectly honest with you. I almost never do a bevel cut on the table saw at the angle I want it to be. Especially with long parts, it's too hard to hold everything completely aligned to the blade the same way through the cut. So if I'm doing like a box miter or something like that, I'll use this table saw to cut the miter to close to what I want it to be, leaving a little extra material behind. And then I'll probably go to a 45 or a 30 degree router bit at the router table and clean the, the miter up. Because I always know that no matter what happens, that bit is always going to be exactly 45 degrees. So that's, I typically do that on my table saw. But that's an excellent question. Yes, I've used those. The magnetic kind, Wixie makes one and a couple others do. And basically what he's talking about is when you raise your blade up, it's a magnetic piece, so you actually just stick the magnetic reader on your, on your blade, and when you lay it over, as you're laying it over, it actually tells you what the angle readout is. And those are remarkably accurate. They're, they're very good. So yeah, that's a, great, that's a great thing to use. One more um, thing to note real quick with that, that's only going to work well if your table is parallel and level. Yes. If your table's not level, yeah, you're going to Yeah, if you're going to use the angle gauge, exactly. He's pointing out that if you're going to use the angle gauge, your table saw pretty much has to be set up so that the table itself is level. Okay, well, yeah, you can zero it on the table, and then it'll tell you the difference between the two angles. Right. Okay, excellent, excellent points. So, and this is why I like an interactive show, because I wouldn't have thought to talk about any of that. All right, so let's talk about the actual cutting process and some of the safety issues here. Uh, first and foremost is... Again, read your owner's manual. Understand what is going on in your saw. Freehand cutting is never, ever, 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 ever done on a saw. You're always going to guide your piece of stock, whatever you're cutting, whatever operation you're doing, it has to be guided by something mechanical. Your hands are not it. And I don't care who you are or how good you are, you can't guide that and cut it and control it properly. And it's going to kill you at some point. 
and guaranteed it. So free handing, no. Now, we do have several options for how to control our stop on the table saw. One is the rip fence itself. So I could guide along my rip fence, and I wouldn't use my hands in that case because I'm too close to the blade, but I can guide along the rip fence. The piece is being guided by the rip fence. We already know that our rip fence is perfectly parallel to our blade, and so we're going to pass over that blade and get a good, straight, clean cut. Or I also have the option of guiding using a miter gauge where I can do my cross cuts or whatever type of cutting I need to do, guiding off the miter gauge. The miter gauge is controlling my part. Now, most miter gauges also come with, if they don't, you know, aftermarket ones have their own fences on them, but even these factory ones, there's a couple of holes in here that allow you to attach either a shop belt or an aftermarket fence to it, so you can actually span the blade and cut through that fence and get back up your part and have total control. So you've got the ability to guide it with the miter fence. The one thing we don't want to do is use both the rip fence and the miter gauge at the same time. And I'll show you why that we don't want to do that. So I've, if I'm pushing with the miter fence, as this piece separates, I'm not holding it, I'm not really controlling it, and when it separates from the main board, it's going to be trapped between the fence and the blade and it's going to kick back, especially if I've got a long piece that I'm cutting sections off, even though we cut it off between the blade and the fence, if that turns even a little bit at that point, it's coming rocking, rocketing out of there. And I have literally seen guys send pieces flying across the shop that way. Uh, so we never use the miter gauge and the fence at the same time. But the rip fence is a very convenient stop if you want to make repeated cross cuts. So what I'm going to do is clamp something to my rip fence that ends prior to the blade so now I can bring a piece over here, and when I cross cut it, there's some room there for it to fall off and not get trapped. And because I am here with micro jig, I'm going to tell you that we have the our dado stop, which is made for doing inlays and cross cut dados and half laps and things like that. But it also functions as a very convenient um, cross cut guide, and it's exactly three inches wide, so you can always know where you're setting it, and that three inches allows even wide parts to twist without getting trapped between the blade and the fence. So some kind of a stop there that comes out beyond the fence will allow you to use the two together, but you're not, um, you're not getting caught. That saw there, the king saw that they brought down here, um, I used it yesterday, that actually has a face on the fence that can be withdrawn all the way back in front of the blade, so it becomes your cross-cut stop. It's a beautiful design. And the old uh, Delta Unifence used to do the same thing. So you want to make sure you're not doing that. Now, I have the blade guard removed from this saw at the moment. But let's talk about blade guards for a few minutes. Um, I will never tell you not to use your blade guard. But I can tell you that in my career of 30 years, I have literally either worked in or visited thousands of wood shops, professional wood shops over the years, and the number of blade guards that were installed in those shops, I could probably count on one hand. If you're comfortable and like your blade guard, by all means use it. Uh, I find that they get in the way more than they actually help me. And the problem I always have is that the plastic pieces in the front here that are supposed to be the blade guard move too much and they can actually get into my blade. But there are also many situations when I've got the fence fairly close to the blade where this is, is simply not going to fit. So you have to know how to operate around it anyways. Um, and you can't use it when you're using a dado blade, by the way, because the part can't pass by. So think about it. It's all about your, uh, your comfort level. But most of them, and, and modern saws are all coming out with riding knives, which I like a great deal. Your blade guard, this bracket that holds your blade guard, is not a riding knife. And in fact, in a lot of saws, the riding knife is a separate piece. So understand how it works, but make your own decisions from there. Again, what's between your ears is your best safety device, and you need to do what's comfortable for you. If you're not comfortable making the cut, don't do it. But that being said, um, you'll notice that I pretty much in my shop, if you watch my videos and, and the things I do online, I'm not using a blade guard. I do use the gripper system for microjig, which is a moving blade guard. It actually travels with my hand, so it protects me from the blade. Um, but the other thing is, let's talk for a minute about blade exposure. 
And I'm going to move the fence out of the way so that the video shows this. Um, how much blade should be above your material when you're cutting? Now, 20, 25, 30 years ago, the manufacturers of these blades would tell you you needed an inch to an inch and a half to two inches of exposure of the blade above the material. And that was for cooling purposes. So that the blade had enough time, the teeth had time to cool in between rubbing on the wood. And I've actually had a blade many years ago, I had a blade actually suddenly overheat and go dish-shaped while it was running, while I was cutting apart. Scariest thing that ever happened. That pretty much doesn't happen with modern blades. Modern blades have all sorts of, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but this one has these little slots put in it, in um, right here. And then a lot of times you'll see a little zigzag laser cut in the middle of the blade. And then the color that's on the blades is not paint to identify the brand, it is actually a Teflon coating. So the modern blades are not only ground and you know designed to, to dissipate the heat, but they actually have features built into them to do it. And so the heating issue really isn't that big a deal anymore. So basically, I prefer to have as little exposure of blade above my material as absolutely possible. Because the less blade that's above the table saw up top, the less damage you can do if something goes dreadfully wrong. But each blade has a particular height that is designed by the manufacturer. So talk to your blade manufacturers if you have questions about this sort of thing. But here's the general rule of thumb that I found from talking to various blade manufacturers. For a rip blade, you want the entire carbide tooth to be above the material at the top of the arc. Just the carbide tooth, but the entire tooth. Not the gullet, but the tooth itself. And I found using, um, I like Freud's glue line grip blade, that with that blade, if I'm a little bit above that or a little bit below that, I do have, you can see the difference in the cut quality. So right in that sweet spot is where you want to be. But a cross cut blade generally only needs to actually cut through the material. Just barely cutting through the material is perfectly fine. You'll get a perfect cut. A combo blade, on the other hand, which combines the qualities of both, I find somewhere in the middle of the tooth is the right, right place to be. But under no circumstances will you see me cutting a, a, a piece with the blade up like that. It just doesn't happen. So if you can find out from your manufacturer what, what the sweet spot is for that particular blade, by all means do it. But if not, do a little experimentation of your own. Try cuts with the blade just a little bit up and a little bit below and see where the best quality of cut comes from. Um, and while we're on the subject of blades, there's absolutely nothing wrong. Many, many woodworkers use a combo blade, they put it into their saw, they lock it down, and they never change blades. They use it for their cross-cutting, they use it for their ripping. Nothing wrong with that. Modern combo blades do a very good job of both ripping and cross-cutting. I personally use, well, I have 16 different blades in my shop. But I, all, I typically use three. I use a rip blade for ripping, I use a cross cut blade for cross cutting, and then I have a uh, plywood blade that is specifically designed to cut plywoods and melamines. And it does a fantastic job cutting even exotic plywoods and melamines without chipping. So those are the three blades I use primarily. But uh, you know, whichever way you want to go, that's fine, but keep that in mind. Now, most blades are made in both a full curve version and a thin curve version. The full curve version is going to be much stiffer. It's not going to tend to flex as much when you're cutting. If your saw is two horsepower or above, go for the full curve blade. You'll get better results and you'll have less issues with flexing and bending, especially when you hit knots or wild grain patterns. That's when you start to see the flex. If you have a smaller saw that's one and, a, one and three quarters horse or a one horse saw, the, the thin curve blade is going to allow you to cut more and thicker materials with the lower horsepower because the cut profile is smaller, so you get a, you're going to get, you need less horsepower to do that. So you can stick to either one as you go. So the, the only real, there's no real problem if you use both types of blades and switching between a full curve and a thin curve, but if you're using a riving knife, that riving knife needs to be adjusted for both. It is a different position for the two blades, so keep that in mind. And also your rib fence scale is going to need to be changed 
between those two types of blades. So if you can do it, sticking to one thickness of blade for all your work is, is a little bit more convenient. I've got a question. Go ahead. Did you ever see that the two brothers in Minnesota have a table saw solutions that they make a thin blade, a thin curved blade? Have you ever seen that case? No, I haven't seen them. I have, uh, I do have a blade that's... They're in Minnesota, it's Wisconsin. A, I have one that's an ultra thin curve. And it's specifically designed for, if you're going to take a, a wide board and rip it into a lot of thin strips, it minimizes the amount of waste. The problem is, the problem that I ran into with that blade, and I, I have it, I've used it. The problem is it's so thin that it flexes anything more than like a half an inch thick and that blade wants to just down. Plus, because it's so thin, it has a pair of stiffeners built into it, so the curve line is actually set off by almost an eighth of an inch from where my normal curve line is. So it requires a separate <laughs> insert blade. It's almost more, more of a pain than it's worth. Does it save a little bit, bit of material? Yes. But unless you're going to be doing that kind of cutting a lot, it's just not worth stepping up to that level. I was just wondering on an underpowered saw if that would work a little bit better. I, I didn't it would certainly, it requires less power to run, to cut through the same piece of wood, yes. The problem is though that you only really require the power when the material you're cutting is relatively thick. And once you get into relatively thick material, that, that blade is going to want to bend and flex even more than a regular blade. So it's, there's a, there's a, uh, I'm not sure it's, I think it's solving a problem that doesn't exist. Um, all right. So any questions on the basic setups that we've talked about so far? I'm going to check the time real quick here just to make sure we're doing, we're doing okay. So, now let's talk a little bit more about some sleds and techniques and advanced stuff. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, zero clearance inserts. Now the factory insert that comes with your saw, and it doesn't matter if it's, doesn't matter what saw it is, they all come with this really wide opening in the insert plate. And that's because, number one, you want to be able to use different size blades, but number two, as you angle the blade, the trunnions on your saw are designed as much as possible that even though the, the, the center of the blade is, is underneath the table, when it pivots, we want the pivot point to actually be at the table so that when it leans, otherwise you need a really wide opening. And they do a pretty good job of that, but it's not perfect. So this opening has to be relatively wide to let you lay the blade over on its side. The problem with that is that when First of all, if you're cutting really thin materials, like quarter inch strips or even eighth inch strips, which I do the demo upstairs with the micro jig, cutting quarter and eighth inch strips all the time, this opening is so wide that there's a danger of those small pieces falling inside the opening while I'm cutting. And that is a serious danger. When you're riding, whether you're using a push stick or a gripper or whatever, if that piece suddenly disappears out from under you, that's a bad deal. So a zero clearance insert allows you, basically it's a blind piece that you bring the blade up through so that the opening is right tight up against the blade. Not only does it support the thinner pieces that you may be working on, but if you're cutting plywoods or melamines or things like that, having the blade slicing against the insert plate, almost like a pair of scissors, supports the material that you're cutting so there's a lot less opportunity for tear out and chipping. And you know, if you look at the magazines, They've done article after article, year after year, about you know, how to cut veneered plywoods without chipping and tearing. A ins uh, zero clearance insert plate is the first step in, pre in you know, preventing that tearing. Now, back when I started doing woodworking, if you wanted a zero clearance insert, you made your own. Now they are available commercially. Uh, they sell some upstairs. They make them for all the different saws, or most of the saws. So if your saw has one, it's probably available. Um, and they make them primarily out of phenolic, which is, it's a really good material for doing this with. Um, I've always had to make mine out of plywood, so, you know, it is what it is. But by being able to make your own, you can create a new one in a few minutes in your shop, anytime you need one, without having to go out and buy one. But for, you know, like this one's a little bit more difficult. It's square, and you have to have leveling pieces, and, and then you have to have a certain amount of clearance for the blade before it comes up through. So. Buying, uh, buying out the zero clearance insert already made is a great idea as well. But you're, 
regardless, your insert plate wants to be as flush with the tabletop as absolutely possible. And they all have some kind of adjustment mechanism built in. You don't want your part dropping off the table or hitting the insert plate when you're leading into your cut. And more importantly, when you're coming out the back side, you don't want to catch a lip back here and have your part suddenly stop moving while you're in the middle of the cut. So make sure that that's leveled out no matter what you do or which type you're using. Um, so the next thing is your miter, your miter gauge. Your miter gauge is a great place to start if you need to build sleds or jigs or fixtures for your saw. One of the, one of the most common ones that everybody makes is a finger joining jig that goes on your miter gauge. And basically it's a board put on here. You put a 3 8 or a quarter inch dado, whatever size um, finger you want to cut. You make one cut through it and then you put an index pin in there that's the same distance away. And once that's all set up, you can cut finger joints. And it gives it's really easy to do. It's pretty easy to set up. Once you make it, if you when I build them, I make them so that I put cleats on the back side so that the next time I put them onto my miter gauge, it's in exactly the same location. And my setup time to do a set of finger joints is minutes. Um, so that's an easy way to do it. Um, I did an article for Wood Magazine a couple of years ago where I show you how to take a factory um, miter gauge like this and make a sliding fence that has an extending flip stop and everything else. And even though it's got basically slots all the way through the middle of it, it's made of two pieces that are milled and then glued up. Relatively easy to make and very, very um, accurate. So it's a great upgrade that you can do in your own shop for your table saw if you don't want to invest $150, $200 in an aftermarket uh, miter gauge. So this miter gauge can be upgraded to do quite a lot. Uh, and then, of course, if you have an aftermarket one, they have all kinds of features on them, and they'll tell you all about that. Uh, the other thing we have the option of doing is building sleds that actually work in your miter gauge. Now, of course, I'm showing you this one because, again, I'm here with micro jigs. So this one actually has slots cut in it, dovetail slots, to use our dovetail clamps. So I can actually set this into my saw, and I can either mount a clamp, uh, cleat on here that's exactly 90 and use it like my miter gauge, or I can clamp a piece on here so that I know it's not going to shift or move while I go past the blade. And you can build all sorts of jigs like this. Just about every magazine has article after article on this. Study them up and, and see which ones work for you. And there's a couple of basic types. One is a panel cutting slip. So if you've got a piece of plywood and you've ripped it, let's say it's four feet long and you've ripped it to 18 inches wide, now you want to cross cut the end so that you know it's square to the edge that you just ripped. Well, if you try to use your miter gauge, the problem is the miter gauge has to be on the lip of the saw before you start the cut. And even on my Delta Unisaw, saw, that's only about 12 inches between the front face of the miter gauge and the, the blade itself. I've got an 18 inch part. I can't back the miter gauge off because now it's going to tilt and it's not accurate. So a panel sled is a piece of plywood and the, the, the squaring cleat that you're going to work against is in the front. And so that allows me to bring that all the way past, and this miter gauge isn't quite, this miter sled isn't quite set up properly, but it allows me to go well past the blade and until my part is cut off, and the part is actually cut off, so I've got this much of the sled still on the table saw, I can rip or cross cut much wider pieces using a panel sled. The other type is uh, a cutoff sled, which generally spans the blade, has guides in both of the miter slots, and allows you to do, especially small pieces, when you have the sled where the guide rail is right up against the fence, it allows you to work with smaller pieces more accurately and um, more, uh, more safely. So many of those things can be built in your own shop and again search the magazine databases. Most of them have done multiple articles on all sorts of different jigs. Um, Woodsmith Magazine several years ago had a tenoning jig that you can build. I've made it more than once for more than one shop that I've worked in over the years and it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's one of the best jigs I've ever built out of the magazine. I think it's issue 187, but you can do a search on that database. Um, and again, um, there's lots of aftermarket miter bar, just the miter bar itself, not the miter gauge. Go ahead. I think it was Woodsmith, if I remember correctly, and if my memory serves, I think it was issue number 187. So that's going back to about 2004 or 5. Um, 
So you can buy the, the miter bar already made. You can make your own miter bars as well. Um, the problem with shop built miter bars, if they're in wood, they move seasonally and they will expand and contract. So if you make it in the springtime where it's relatively moist, in the winter you might find that it's a little bit sloppy and vice versa. If you make it in the wintertime when it's quite dry, it might not be, uh, it might not fit your miter gauge anymore in the summer. So I tend to use plastic on mine. And there's any number of aluminum and metal ones that are available on the market. And basically they're going to look just like the bar here where, again, it's a metal bar that has some mechanism for fitting it to the slot. Um, I happen to really like the zero plate guide bar that you see here, again a microjig product, but this actually has full contact along both sides of the bar along the entire nine inches and it can adjust from 0.73 to 0.79 inches wide so it'll fit any standard three quarter miter slot. And I like it because when I travel from store to store around the country to do my demos, I can always readjust it very quickly and easily to whatever miter slot or whatever saw I happen to be working on. So, that's a really nice thing. And then you'll notice when I mounted it to my sled here, I actually used uh, slots instead of holes so that when I came here yesterday and set up to do the saw thing, I was able to loosen these, get relatively close to the blade, and then square it up using my rip fence, tighten it back down. But if I wanted to take this over to my router table and use it there, I could just loosen the screws, adjust it to fit the router table properly. These are the sorts of things I like to think about when I build jigs and fixtures. Um, feather boards are another thing. Um, I typically tend not to use them, but um, because I use the grippers and they're not compatible really. But on my on my uh, router table, I certainly use feather boards, and I have used them on the table saw as well. They have magnetic types that will fit, you know, will lock down anywhere on your table saw if your top is cast iron. Um, a lot of the new smaller saws are either aluminum or you know some some kind of non-ferrous metal, so magnetic is not going to be your friend. And then there's many that mount into the miter slot as well, and then are adjustable in and out for whatever cut you want to make. The only thing I don't like about feather boards on the table saw, you have to be a little bit careful. You have to make sure that the force of the feather board is well in front of the blade, because what you don't want is for the feather board, as the piece separates on the blade, you don't want the feather board to push the off-fall piece into your blade which is then going to flex your blade into your keeper part. So you need to set it up very carefully. I often, if I'm using dado blades or I even use the molding head cutters on my table saw, I'll often mount feather boards on the fence this way, holding the piece down so that I know as I work through, it's not going to be lifting up off the table as I'm pushing along. Um, this particular fence, if this is adjusted properly, it actually locks in the back so I can use a feather board there without this lifting. The typical Beesmeyer type fence, you can still do that, but you, you're going to want to put a clamp back here once you get it set to keep that from lifting up off your saw. Um, the other thing is when you're cutting thin materials, laminates, um, veneers, you know, if you're cutting the actual veneer or laminate, getting ready to lay it onto a substrate, those materials are very thin, and almost every miter, uh, f uh, rip fence has a little gap underneath it so it's not scraping across your tabletop. You do not want to be in the middle of a cut and have that thing slide underneath the fence. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll add an auxiliary fence to the face of my table, uh, my grip fence here, and I'll actually put a little cleat on the bottom of it, and I'll let the, the flexible material ride on top of that cleat. I know it can't go any further than that, and it's a much safer way to cut my veneers and my thin materials. So anybody have any questions? Um, anything that you want to ask? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a, um, a stabilizing plate is one of the nice things. Well, here's the thing: every saw is going to have some run out. Okay, no matter what you do. Now, I've actually measured my saw scientifically. And my, my Dutchie Unisaw with a Freud blade on it at home right now has a, a run out of about a thousandth of an inch overall, which is really, really nice. But the problem is this, the bearings that hold your arbor as it's spinning, if they had zero run out, they wouldn't turn. That's physics. So there has to be a certain amount of play in there or else it wouldn't turn. And then no blade is perfectly flat. That being said, your run out should never be more than three or four thousandths. 
And if it is more than that, you'll actually feel it in the saw. It'll vibrate. A good quality blade, honestly, I haven't encountered a well-made, um, you know, if you're buying a $20 saw blade, yeah, you might have some run out on that sucker. But, um, you know, even at the $60 and $70 level and up, you're not going to get a lot of run out on the blades. They, they're pretty careful about the way they balance them now. Stabilizers, if you want to use one, there's nothing wrong with that. It will limit your maximum elevation, the thickness that you can cut. But honestly, most 10-inch table saw blades can cut to about 3 inches thick. And very few of us ever cut to 3 inches thick, period. Usually when you raise your blade up that high, you're raising a panel or something like that. And that's another thing to mention real quick. If you're going to do pieces standing on edge, uh, this fence, and it's not much shorter than most others. The problem is if I want to do a raised panel, let's say I've got my blade angled, I can hold it like this, but there's not a lot of support there. Um, and I didn't bring it down with me, so I apologize. But um, if you come over to the micro jig booth, I'll show you a tall fence that attaches to your micro fence, your rip fence. And that tall fence provides you the extra support that you need so that when you're doing bevel work or edge grooving or that, when you're working on edge, it gives you the extra support. That's another type of jig. And again, most of the magazines have shown various articles on how to build that sort of thing. Um, they've covered pretty much in 25 or 30 years that these magazines have been printed, they've covered just about everything you want to look at. And the good news is most of the magazines now, their entire history is available on DVD that you can buy and have every issue of every magazine ever made for a couple hundred bucks if that's where you want to go. Um, but yes, stabilizing plates are a great thing. If you are having issues, if you are concerned about it, just remember that it is going to limit your up. You've got a 25-year-old who has never touched the belt, dry belts, or anything. <coughs> is it something you have to do for preventive maintenance, or what do you do with the dry belts? With the, the dry belts on a Unisaw are a bear to replace. Okay, there's three of them. On an older Unisaw like that, there's going to be three of them, and they're incredibly tight. That being said, I've only had to ever do it once. So basically for you, what you would want to do is just visually inspect the belts, just like on your car. Visually inspect the belts and make sure that they're not frayed or worn or anything like that. Um, but until one actually starts showing wear and fraying, I would not replace them. Um, I also have a 25-year-old Unisaw, and I've never replaced the belts on it, and they're still in very good condition. Unlike the belts on your car, they're not constantly being heated and cooled. They're not constantly being exposed to elements and weather and water splashing up and all the other horrible things that happen underneath your engine compartment. Inside your saw, generally speaking, it's a pretty controlled environment. It gets dusty, but that's about it. So good dust control will make your belts last a lot longer because you're not going to get crap built up between the belt and the pulleys as, you're, as, you're, as it's running. But, you know, regardless of what kinds of belts you have or what kinds of saw you have, that's part of your maintenance procedure is just to inspect that and make sure that it's not fraying or wearing. Um, but again, there is a procedure for, repair, uh, for replacing those. I've done it. It's not fine. Uh, but if you ever have to do it, don't replace one belt. Replace them all three at the same time. It's a bear to do, and you only want to do it once in your lifetime. For contractor type saws, yes. For a Unisaw or cabinet saw, no, I wouldn't bother. But the, the see, I, I started my career, my first table saw was a 25-year-old craftsman that I bought used. And yeah, that one, when you first turn it on, the whole saw would kind of jump because that belt develops a memory where it stops. And, and it flapped a lot when it was running. So the link belts actually reduce that flapping and they don't bear a memory because they're made up of individual sections. They do on a contractor saw, they'll smooth that sucker right out. They are very good for that. But I wouldn't put them on something like a, a Unisaw. Or, they're not, they're really good for the lower powered saws. They're very, they're not nearly as good for when you get up above two horsepower. There's a lot of torque on that system when you first fire that blade up because your saw doesn't have a soft start. I think the saw stop actually does, but most saws don't have the saw stop start, so it's like instant on. So the link belts are good for the, the contractor saws. Any other questions, comments, anything else? Go ahead, way in the back. What are the odds when you call any given blade manufacturer to find out that information? 
The question, just in case anybody didn't hear it, was what are the odds that when you call your blade manufacturer to try to find out about the height setting or other things that I've talked about, that you're actually going to get somebody on the phone that knows what the hell they're talking about? Um, it, depends on, it depends on the company. Now, I will tell you that um, Freud, for example, um, if you call, ask for somebody, you know, ask for technical support, and the guys that answer that are actually engineers. They're very, very good. Um, uh, what's the other? Forest. When you call Forest to talk to them, you're going to talk to the people that actually make the blades. They're a very small company. Um, other companies, you know, it's it's kind of a hit or miss. But um, I will tell you that I've got some business cards up here and. I've also got, uh, I mentioned that I've got the information on my Amazon stuff. Um, take one if you want to. If you ever have questions, reach out to me on email and I'll be happy to talk to you and answer questions. Um, I have the advantage of having worked with a bunch of these manufacturers. I have a level of access that the average consumer doesn't have. So, but I've spent a lot of time studying all this stuff over the last 30 years. So, you know, if you need, I'll be happy to answer questions as well. And if it were up to me, I would have a you know a, an FAQ section on my website that answered all those questions, so that I don't have to answer phone calls. But I will tell you that again, I like Freud blades. They make I think they make as good a blade as anybody makes for the price. Okay, but their website is only okay, and their YouTube channel is non-existent and terrible. You know, it is. I don't know what to do about that. You know, I can't do anything. It's not my company. But that's kind of what I found. So, you know, um, if you you know if you have questions and if you can't get to the manufacturer, reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk to you and help you if I can. Would the rule of thumb be uh, just the, just the tip of the carbide? On crosscut blades, the tip of the carbide. On Fulker um, rip blades, the entire carbide tooth above the material. And on the combo blade, somewhere in the middle of the tooth, and you may want to experiment with it to see where your best cuts are. And you'll probably find on the combo blade that your cross-cutting height setting should be a little bit different than your rip height setting. Because it's the way that the teeth may, are made. There's an amazing amount of science that goes into the design of a saw blade these days. It's actually mind-boggling how much science and physics are put into not only the design of the blade body itself, but the actual way that the teeth are ground. And there are lots and lots of variables with the, the grind angles and whether there's you know back angles for clearance and rake angle that you know how far the teeth leans forward or back relative to the center line of the blade. It's an amazing amount of science that goes into all that. And so the more of that that you understand, the better. But as a general rule of thumb, cross cut, minimal exposure, um, Rip blade, just the tooth, combo blade somewhere in the middle. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll be upstairs in the microphone booth if you have questions about anything.